words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Uh, for me, it is a, a, an absolute privilege to be with you today uh, to explore this important theme, experiencing life with God. And I consider it a privilege because what we're doing is, in many ways, as was mentioned this morning, we're looking back, but we're also looking forward in celebration. Uh, it's a privilege to celebrate the way that the past two generations of the church have been influenced so directly and de deeply by Richard Foster and his Celebration of Discipline, and by Dallas Willard and his Spirit of the Disciplines, which that has been my favorite book of his uh, through the years. I've met Richard on only a couple of occasions that have been influenced by his writings and his leadership in the Christian community through Renovare. It's been a powerful impact to me, and so uh, Richard, wherever you are, thank you. With Dallas, it's a bit different as I have worked closely with him on many projects in the past nearly 40 years. We have worked closely on academic and scholarly projects, in conferences and retreats, in the classroom and in the church. And he and I differed significantly on his interpretation of the Beatitudes. Uh, but as I told him, there's nobody who exemplified the virtue of the Beatitudes more than Dallas Willard. So he is not here to thank, but I saw Jane this morning, and I'd like to say thank you to Jane for the way in which she shared Dallas with us over the years. Now, we all know that Dallas was a pretty bright guy, right? Pretty bright guy. But what always struck me about Dallas, for all of his academic and scholarly credentials, was that Dallas was a man of the Bible. I remember one seminar I put on when postmodernism was uh, really a big issue addressing the way in which we interpreted scripture, and I brought Dallas in as a seminar speaker on that. And, and he got right to the depth of the issues philosophically, but he also brought in how the Bible needs to be our central focus. For him, the formed life concerns the Bible. And life experience with God in his discipleship to Jesus was guided and superintended by the Bible. That is why I'm honored to explore briefly this afternoon the topic, Scripture and the Formed Life in the New Testament. Because experiencing life with God in the presence of Jesus, guided by his word, is intensely transformational. Nearly 50 years ago, this year, I was a 19-year-old kid sitting on a guard perimeter in the jungle of Vietnam. I acted like a very brave young combat paratrooper, but I was scared to death. I'd been in combat for the last 11 months, and I had watched nearly everyone around me in my squad and platoon get killed or wounded, or medevac to the rear. I was so close to going home, just another three weeks, but what if I didn't make it? And there I sat in the dark in the jungle, waiting for an attack from the enemy, and wondered if I was next, and what would happen to me if I was killed. I wasn't a Christian. One of the guys in my squad was a Christian, and he had been talking with me about eternity and death and life. And there that night as I waited, I realized that there was either a God or there wasn't. It is just that simple. And if there was a God, that would be the most significant issue in my life. But I also thought, what real difference would it make in my life? I had seen many church people for whom the God issue made no real difference in their lives. I made no decision either for or against the reality of God that night. But it put me on a quest that lasted for the next two years until some people very simply but profoundly opened the Bible to me and introduced me to Jesus. And as I met him and experienced a radical transformation, I became 
a person of the Bible. Yes, later I would become a New Testament professor and I get paid to study and teach the Bible. That's pretty cool. But I am a person of the Bible as the means to the end, not the end itself. The Bible became my compass through life, to live life the way God intended life to be lived. It became my statement of reality, my experience of the living word of God in the presence of Jesus. Now, Tremper has taken us on a powerful journey through the Old Testament. I love his perspective. If we want a closer relationship with Jesus and want to learn to be more like him, just read the Old Testament. The New Testament continues that biblical drama as we come face to face with Jesus. In the very first narrative of the canonical New Testament, Matthew takes us into the experience of Mary and Joseph as the virgin is found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. He's to be named Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. But the infant is also the one that Matthew tells us fulfills the prophecy in Isaiah, behold, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The name Jesus specifies what he does, God saves, and Emmanuel specifies who he is, God with us. These are highly charged names that speak of a prof profound Christological orientation by Matthew. Notice how Matthew even concludes his gospel with the same theme, where Jesus promises his disciples, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. The idea of salvation and reconciliation with God was not a human idea. It was God's idea. And it was God's activity in the Son becoming a human baby, so that God would be with us, and would become the basis of experiencing life with God. I am convinced that we need to heed carefully Jesus' message in his Great Commission that true belief in Jesus for salvation produces disciples of Jesus. There has been a current that I have seen in my years as a Christian where we have divided Christianity into two tiers. You become a Christian and then you get really committed and you become a disciple. And so the discipleship sayings of the Bible are optional for the majority of people. They're just content to be a Christian. No. In Jesus' words, to become a Christian is to be made a disciple. From the moment I received Jesus as my Savior, I became his disciple. I was ushered into this new life solely through the grace of God. And the life that began through faith continues through faith. Jesus called me to follow him. When I obeyed, it set the pattern for my entire life. Discipleship is not optional. He made me into a disciple and he continues to cause me to grow as I am obedient to him. And this is especially evident when we look at the Gospel of John. And there are three marks, and I don't know how many I'll get through, but we'll get through probably one. Uh, but three marks in the Gospel of John that are evidences of our discipleship to Jesus, and these are not optional. So I hope you brought your Bible. And we'll look at a beginning narrative with it, first of all, in John chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. We have here the scene of the feeding of the 5,000. And after the feeding of the 5,000, when they, John writes, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And then Jesus issues in a, a long discourse where he describes who he is in metaphorical terms, that he is the bread of life, etc. And if you turn to verse 51 in John chapter 6, he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Whoa. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat 
the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. John goes on to say, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Now, that's understatement. We're way too familiar with that, aren't we? I mean, if there is a, uh, any one of you, say, the first Sunday of the week, first Sunday of the month, you celebrate communion, a Martian lands in the back and comes in to attend your service, and the pastor holds up, this is the body of Jesus, eat it. This is the blood of Jesus. Drink it. What that Martian's going to think? Cannibalism, which was the first charge against the early Christians. It is a hard saying. Jesus is now going to give an entirely new way of looking at what the religious life is about and what it means to obtain salvation. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples grumbled about this, said to them, do you take offense of this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words I have spoken to you are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. And then comes what is, for me, one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture, verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. His disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, here's my man, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. This statement of Peter is a primary example of how a true disciple has claimed Jesus' words about eternal life and is set free from any other attempt to gain salvation. The many disciples who left Jesus could not comprehend nor accept Jesus' statement of the reality of how eternal life will now be acquired. Peter and the ten did. Now Jesus records these three sayings about the evidences of true discipleship. And if we don't get to them all, I'll give them to you ahead of time. John 8, 31 and 32. John 13, 34 and 35. John 15, 7 and 8. Three marks of experiencing life with God as guided by God's word. The first mark is abiding in Jesus' words in John 8, 31 and 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Are these believers? It says they're believers. But when we look at the context, we'll find that Jesus said they did not truly believe. They, it is probably the first example we find of a head belief as opposed to a heart belief. And Jesus goes on to show how they were actually sons of the devil. Abiding means to remain in the sphere of existence, which is here Jesus' word. The evidence of true belief is seen in disciples who cling to Jesus' word as the truth for life. True disciples are free from bondage to sin through Jesus' liberating word. So here we see that abiding in the word issues in transformation and transformation of mind and values to be free from sin. As we compare the words of the world with the words of Jesus, and we move into the realm of Jesus' word as a statement of our reality, we are now set free from the lies of the world, the flesh, and the devil. This begins with abiding in Jesus' word about eternal life, resulting in salvation, but it also becomes now the standard for all of life. But when Jesus says that abiding in his word will be a characteristic of his disciples, he does not mean perpetual Bible study or even a regular devotional time as a necessary evidence of spirituality. It is quite possible to have a regular devotional time or to be a Bible whiz without actually growing as Jesus' disciple. 
Remember again the scribes and the Pharisees of Jesus' day. They were the leading authorities of Old Testament scripture, yet Jesus said many were lifeless spiritually. Disciplines of study, guidance, meditation, etc., are means to the end of acquiring truth so that we can live more effectively with Jesus. They are not the final goal itself. The goal is transformation of our lives to be formed to the image of Jesus. I'll close with this one example. A definition of success. How would you define success? Success. Material wealth or happiness. Think of, think of your field, success. Visibility, excellent. Visibility, power, prestige. In our field, how many books do you write? We go to these academic conferences every year that my wife calls the Gathering of the Nerds. And they have, they have name tags that are about three times as large as yours. And when you walk through the halls, people don't look at your face. They don't look you in the eye. They look at your name tag to see who you are, where you teach, what you've accomplished. I've had uh, some physical difficulties the last few years, and I was ushered into an emergency room where the doctor said to me, the emergency room doctor said to me, you could probably die today. Bedside manner wasn't great. <laughs> it freaked my wife out who was with me. But you know, it, it was good for me to hear that because the words that Jesus said will signify what it means to be a success in our lives, friends, is well done, thou good and faithful servant. God bless you.